Well, at this time, we'd like to get uh, started with our uh, Roach Ag Marketing Analysis. Uh, we have John Roach. Uh, I had mentioned a week ago, uh, we had John hit uh, Sheffield, and then you went to Cedar Rapids in a, a couple of days in uh, Wisconsin with uh, a great uh, reception out there. I gotten to know uh, uh, John about six years ago. I met up out to a dealership out in uh, western Kansas, and uh, John had a room full of, at that time, about 200, 250 people and uh, really kept them uh, entranced. And uh, right after his meetings, corn kept going up from 3 4 5 6 and $7. So uh, uh, the more often we talk to John, the better. But uh, uh, John's had great reception. As I mentioned earlier, he really combined science and looking at the marketing with some common sense and then giving you a market plan and willing to say, hey, this is what I believe the market's going to do. These are the fundamentals and why. You look at them and see if you agree with me. So uh, with that, we'll turn it over to John and welcome. Thanks, Steve. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dusuka Manufacturing. Uh, uh, what a great Iowa company uh, celebrating a 50th anniversary and employing about 600 people. What a great company. And, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to, uh, to visit with some of your dealer people. And, and my purpose this morning is to uh, is to share some information about the longer term outlook in the grain market and, and not even such a long term outlook. Uh, and I think there's more optimism than what we're able to, uh, what we're hearing out there in the country. First of all, it's important to understand that the negative environment we're in is all as a con or almost all a consequence of record world production. Um, across all of the things, uh, the agriculture commodities. Uh, last year, and this is the, the red bar here on this graph, uh, is the world coarse grain production. Uh, and by coarse grain, we're talking about uh, uh, the uh, uh, feed grains other than wheat and oil seeds. And so as you can see, the uh, production last year, although not a new record, uh, followed a substantially new record uh, the year prior. Um, and uh, uh, and that came as a consequence of of uh, a very good yield just last year on a little bit smaller acreage. A world wheat production also set a new record, which of course is competing with uh, the feed grain market in a lot of environments. Uh, soybeans uh, established a big new record, and this was the crop that was again harvested uh, in South America a year ago and in North America uh, last fall. And so uh, we, we have new bars that are going to go on this graph uh, for the production out of South America this year uh, and North America as well. Uh, rice production was also uh, at, a, at a near record. So the, the food supplies in the world, the grain component, oilseed component of food supplies in the world were very large and contributed to the decline in the marketplace. Now what it is, what, what, what people tend to do is they tend to look at production growth and uh, and believe that it will continue. The one commodity that didn't have record production or close to it was cotton. Um, in addition, uh, the uh, money flow has been negative to commodity markets. Uh, this graph shows the S&P 500 index moving upward over the period of the last three years, while at the same time the Dow Jones UBS commodity index moved downward. Uh, in markets, um, I'm sure you're all aware, the money flows to wherever the hot market is. And the equities have been very hot as the Fed has kept interest rates very low, uh, while commodities uh, have been pressured uh, primarily because most of these indexes uh, have oil as a main component. Uh, the commodity indexes uh, have crude oil and heating oil and, and uh, gasoline and so forth as components. And as you can see, and as you know, since last summer, uh, crude oil prices have dropped precipitously, uh, setting new lows just this week. Um, uh, taking a moment to look at the oil production, um, because it is a part of, of what we're going to be living with here in the commodity business. Uh, remember, uh, as the index flows south, it's sort of like a river flowing south. There will be some commodities in that index that can swim north against the stream. But as the stream is flowing south, it, it, that, it's hard for, uh, uh, for commodities in general to move higher. Uh, recently, we've seen people blame uh, Saudi's unwillingness to 
uh, cut their production as a reason for oil prices being cheap. But the the reality is the the production increases that have cost us uh, that have caused the oil market to go down ha has actually happened in the United States. A as you can see, we used to produce 2.4 million barrels less than the Saudis, and now we are producing 2.7 million barrels more. And so uh, uh, this particular slide uh, done by uh, Dr. Mark Perry, he terms it Saudi America um, because our production numbers uh, are uh, exceeding the Saudis now. Um, we're continuing to, to increase the production. Uh, there's a, the most recent updated numbers and, uh, came through February, uh, and we're producing the most energy we have since back in the early uh, 1970s. Um, we're slowing down the rate that we're drilling. Um, U.S. total rig count uh, is off sharply uh, from its peak here over the last uh, 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 prior to fall of about 1,900 rigs actively drilling for new wells. It's dropped off to uh, something in a neighborhood of about 1,200. Um, what that tells you is that we will, um, as wells play out as they're as they're completely utilized uh, we will reduce the the quantity of oil that's being produced but there's quite a bit of a lag time here uh, the with the new technology that we have uh, and an average well brings in about 750 barrels a day and they have a life expectancy of about 750,000 barrels so uh, they really have a about a thousand day life expectancy if you will so there's a three year uh, a period of time from when you bring it into production uh, until that that well is about uh, finished. Uh, the other thing that uh, that's not, does not show up here is the more efficient horizontal and directional boring uh, well uh, 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 drills uh, are only down about the last number I saw 16 percent from their peak. So what we've done in the in the United States, as you would expect, we've taken the least efficient uh, rigs out of production, uh, but we're continuing to pump from the wells that are there. The variable cost to pump uh, is uh, is not all that expensive, uh, and and so it uh, uh, oil at today's price more than covers that variable cost. Uh, the uh, three primary uh, uh, energy production areas, the new air energy production areas, as you can see, the Permian Basin, Eagle Ford, and Bakken are all continuing to ramp up. Uh, we have not yet hit peak production. And uh, let me get to the right slide. Here we are. And uh, to put those geographically on a map, you can see uh, uh, where they're all located. And uh, uh, again, as as long as we're continuing to set new records, uh, it's going to be hard to imagine that oil prices start to increase. Um, certainly, the uh, oil is uh, uh, there's not lots and lots of people that are uh, making these decisions on which oil, uh, which wells to pump, and so forth. And so, it may be that that uh, that they will purposely slow down production, but it's a little bit like farming. Once you've sunk all the capital expense, uh, you've got the land uh, leased, and uh, it's awful hard to uh, to not go through, go forward with, with uh, some of your plans. And those that have the, the strongest financials will continue to drill, knowing that uh, there will be a day when prices move higher. Um, it'd be my suggestion that that, that upward move in oil prices is still months away um, and we, we need to start to see some slowdown uh, in the production before we can really anticipate it. Uh, one of the interesting uh, ways of looking at oil prices uh, and that is to take the uh, average hourly wage and figure out how long do you have to work in order to buy enough gasoline at today's price to dive 100 miles. And as you can see, uh, we're uh, giving the, uh, the, the people, the, the working people of the United States, uh, the people that are using their vehicles for commercial purposes, uh, as well as for, for recreation, we're giving them the opportunity to drive 100 miles 
uh, spending less of their time to earn those wages. And that's a huge economic benefit for this country. It's also a huge economic benefit for any other country uh, that, uh, that is not a energy producer or a surplus energy producer. This drives economic recovery. Uh, shifting away from the, the overall index in energy, let's look specifically at corn. Uh, and remember, the, the business that your customers are in, or perhaps you're in, uh, is, is feeding people. And, uh, and that business uh, uh, has a, is a growing marketplace. Uh, there's a graph of the, of the uh, demographics from the United uh, Nations world population uh, uh, people. And as you can see, we currently have about nine, uh, 7 billion people uh, headed toward 8 billion by 2024 and 9 billion by 2048. Uh, what's interesting is to look at the amount of food growth on our charts when we look at adding a billion people. Uh, and as you can see, from 1999 to 2012, we added a billion people. How does that look here on the total coarse grain usage? And again, this is feed usage. And as you can see, um, as you expand the population from uh, 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 6 billion people, we used a little over 850 million metric tons. And with 7 billion people, we use 1,150 million metric tons. And so there is the growth rate that we experienced with the last billion. My suggestion would be we'll have a similar growth rate for the next billion. Uh, so from uh, uh, the 2011-12 crop year uh, going out to the 2024 crop year, uh, we can expect this graph to continue to show increases. Um, I did uh, want to take out ethanol because a lot of people say, well, these increases all came because of ethanol. But let me show you that ethanol actually crested in the United States in the 2010-11 crop year. And so 2010-11 is here. And so the growth that we've had since then, if we're not going to use feed grains to turn into ethanol, the only other thing we use feed grains for other than that uh, is to feed livestock, uh, to produce milk, meat, and eggs. And so the growth that we've had since the 2010-11 crop year is a growth in milk, meat, and egg production worldwide. Um, if you look at the population in the world and see where that population resides, you can see that uh, at 65% of the population is at China's GDP per capita and lower. And so it's, uh, uh, we don't expect to see big food growth in the United States, Germany, or Japan. The Western nations are uh, uh, mature nations and, and um, developed. Uh, the place where we'll see the growth is down on the other half of it. and. Uh, uh, we also worry about economic conditions, and people will say, well, with the economies the way they are, blah, blah, blah. But the reality of it is that China's growing, even though it's a lot slower growth, it's still a 7.5% GDP growth rate for the biggest economy in the world, with people who are earning about $10,000 GDP per capita. Uh, India, as you'll notice, uh, is at an even lower GDP uh, uh, rate, but it's also growing uh, uh, at a faster pace than China, um, 7 to 8 percent annual growth rate. So when we look at the demand for the food, uh, we have to anticipate not only population demand increases, we have to an anticipate economic improvement increases. and. Uh, uh, when you're growing a, a, an entire economy at 7.5%, uh, the middle class uh, is uh, getting lots more income in order to uh, provide better for their family. So we think the demand for milk, meat, and eggs uh, is, is strong and healthy. And we see that continuing, at least for the, for the very near future, uh, let's say the next year or so, uh, we, we would see it even longer if we could be assured that China would maintain this growth rate. And we are reasonably assured of that, but, but we don't know. We certainly have to keep paying attention. So the driver here 
to the marketplace, which has been the overproduction in the world, needs to shift in people's focus to the size of demand. And when we start looking at demand, things become very interesting. Um, we like to look at it, uh, these tables, and I know you can't see these tables, but if you were to look down and see what demand growth, or we call it usage growth, how it's increased over the years, you can see some years with 4% increase. And by the way, this is for course rates. You can see some years of 4% increase, some years of reduction, uh, which occurred in the years that we had smaller crops. You'll notice the smaller production, and we end up with a reduction as far as usage is concerned. Um, and then as we move through time, as, as the supplies become available, we see 4%, 3%. You can see quite a few years. And last year, following the, the drought of the 2012-13 crop year, our demand grew by 9%. Now remember, this is demand increase in feed grain. So the only way you can increase feed grain is you have to have increased animal numbers uh, out there. So although we didn't have the supplies of the, of the principally produced feed grains available in 2012-13, you can see the reduction there, almost 20 million tons, we some way or another, we kept the animals alive. It shows a reduction in, in feed usage of 1.67%, of but the reality is we fed those animals something because you can't expand your herds uh, or flocks by 9% in one year without having kept the breeding stock from the prior year. So uh, the uh, producers of milk, meat, and eggs in the world uh, have recognized the need to, to keep the breeding stock intact, even in years of tight supply. Okay, so let's, let's look out ahead. Uh, uh, well, the, the, first of all, let's recap the usage growth. For the last 15 years, the average increase has been 2.46%. If we look at it over a 10-year window, it's been 265, five years, 262. So average annual growth rate in usage is 2.58%. I would suggest that this is a pretty reliable um, uh, number to hang your hat on. Uh, this has happened over a long period of time, and uh, it's occurring because of population. It's occurring because of economic growth. Uh, as we look forward, we think economic growth and population will continue on this curve. As a consequence, we think that average growth uh, of 2.5% would be a reasonable forecast. Um, however, for our purposes, we're going to project average usage grows 2% per year. So we think we're maybe a little bit conservative uh, on what our estimate is. But let's look at that on a graph. A 2% increase, as you can see, uh, this is the year we're in today. Uh, what we're suggesting is next year it goes up 2% and the year after goes up 2%. As you can see, that really follows along the line with the exception of the outlier year when we simply didn't have the supplies available. Now let's take those and put them on a, on a table again. Um, the first assumption we're making here for the new year, this is the crop that your customers or perhaps yourselves will be planting uh, very soon. Uh, this is the, the planting in the, in the uh, spring of 15, utilized out through August 31 of 16. Um, the first assumption I'm making is that uh, coarse grain acreage will come down slightly. Uh, as you can see, it actually uh, uh, increased from the 12-13 because of price levels. We jumped it uh, by about 8 million hectares. Uh, and then because of profitability, uh, we reduced it uh, by about 5 million hectares uh, last year. I think we reduced it another 2.5 million hectares in the upcoming year. Uh, we've already seen that happen uh, in uh, South America. Uh, and uh, we expect to see acreage reductions in North America, and uh, so uh, we're using a number of 316. If you want to argue with these numbers and you want to put it in at a different number, that's okay. Again, we're just being economists here, and so on one hand we get this, and on the other hand we get that. Uh, but this is my best estimate for a moment. Uh, as far as yields are concerned, uh, I think yields could come down a little bit because this was such an, uh, a big uh, uh, yield that we had last year. So I'm using a, a, 
a crop of 3.9 million tons per hectare, which, uh, which is just uh, back to what the record was prior to this last year. That leaves us a production of 1248, a 2% increase in usage, uh, it uh, gives us uh, a 1290, and when I do the math, it cuts my ending stocks in the world to 177, and that's for August 31 of 2016. That, if we uh, look at it on a numerical basis, you can see that that's more than we had in 1213, but when we use stocks as a percentage of usage, it's actually smaller. It's sort of like it used to be when uh, the farm only cost 100000 to run, if you had 1000 left over, you had uh, 1%. Now it costs 200000 to run. If you only have 1000 left over, it's only half a percent. So you can see very quickly here how uh, uh, those percentages change. And we like to do it in days of supply because we think it helps us uh, understand it a little easier. And it's a 50-day supply. And again, that's next fall, 16. And as you can see here, that's smaller than anything we've had here since the 2010 year. Let's go the next year. Let's go, and, and now the next year, let's say that corn prices are better next year. Uh, this is the reason you sell farmers bins this year. They should not be selling their new crop corn at harvest. They should not be selling their new crop corn today for harvest delivery. They should be putting up bins to store it. It'll be worth more. And here's why. A year from today, this is March 19th of 2016. I'm going to be forecasting the following year's crop. And for a moment here, we'll put the acreage back up again because we think corn prices will be higher. I'll put the yield back up again at a record because we need to have it. And that gives us a production of 1280. I put a 2% increase on my utilization. Again, I don't think high prices or ahead on corn, I think, but I think at five dollar corn we could continue that two percent increase pretty easily. But look what it does to stocks: 141 million metric tons. It's a 10 percent stocks of percentage utilization, a 39 day supply, and on a graph it looks like this. So. Everybody who's looking backwards and telling you about the big production numbers last year and how they're going to continue to be big, okay, but they have to start looking at utilization. And when they do, they realize the 2% growth rate in utilization, if we only increase production, the numbers that I'm using, you can see what ends up happening by the time we get into 17. Now, we can't have stocks that tight. So prices have to strengthen in order to ration out the supplies that will be there. And again, you can play with the numbers. You can uh, uh, adjust these in here. But what you're going to find is that you're going to have to really start to increase acreage or really increase yields in order to supply this increasing utilization uh, if we grow at a 2%. And remember, we've been growing at 25 so um, uh, play with the numbers, uh, but I think as you talk with your customers about uh, these potentials, uh, I think maybe they'll also realize that we have higher prices ahead, uh, not cheaper prices. Uh, by the way, the supply number using my uh, numbers uh, turns pretty horizontal, and as you'll notice, that's kind of the pattern. We, we reach up to a new yield, and then we turn horizontal, and that's really what I'm saying. Uh, we already know that the John, South American production John, is down seven. Excuse me? John, we'll yes. just take a quick, if there's any questions, if you'd want to flip back to that uh, days left of uh, supply, that, that, I think that graph is really telling right there. And if there's any questions from our group at this time, or, but uh, to me, that, that, this graph is the one that really hit me, that just the ending stocks days of supply is going to be the lowest we've seen in 15 years. And that, and you go back to the other days of low supplies, those are when our prices go up. That's exactly right. And the, and the key here is this is the inventory we we're dealing with today, the red bar. Okay. You'll want to store that inventory or you want to store the inventory the next harvest. You want to put it into bin space and get prepped for this. I think farmers will pay for bins in one year in this environment. It could be next year, if not, likely the year after. 
We've already seen the reduction in South America, and you'll notice the potential reduction here from the current estimate of 101 million tons of corn down to 89 uh, is quite a deviation. And the reason is they're, they're off to such a slow start in planting. Uh, this crop is in danger of, uh, of coming into uh, seed filling, uh, 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 kernel filling after the wet season. Uh, the outlier here is this big yield number uh, in the United States, and that uh, helped drive the big world number. Uh, it's sure possible we could do it again, but we can't be betting on that. We should be betting, as you'll see on my numbers, I'm betting at 165. Um, my yield number for the new year, 165 in the United States, that takes production on 18 million tons. So again, you go back to South America's down six, we're down 18, that's down 24. So, and we don't know what Russia's gonna do and we don't know what Ukraine's gonna do because they're really in unusual situations there. Uh, there's our US corn usage that, that we're projecting here and you can see how quickly our US stocks come back into a more tighter picture. Might be tighter because I think usage could actually be bigger. Uh, here's how we've, uh, we, we pay attention to, uh, we have a sell signal indicator, as you'll see on the bottom of the graph, and every time you get the red line and the blue line above the horizontal black line, that's a sell signal. Think of it as the digital thermometer. The thermometer gets over 75, that's when we want to make sales. We really like making sales in March, April, May, and June. And here's our May 15 corn sales. You see we saw quite an opportunity to do quite a few last spring. It got cheaper through the summer, and then we came back, and we ignored these. We don't like to sell in October, November. And we made some sales here and some sales here. Uh, right now, we're kind of in the middle. Here's our December 15 sales. Again, you can see that our indicator has kept us selling in the upper part of the market rallies. Uh, soybeans, I can't get a very positive uh, outlook. Here's the total usage, 6 billion to 7 billion people, 3.8% average annual increase in usage. I use 3.5 here in my table, and you'll see I went from 113-day supply August of 15 to 114 August of 16 to 124 August of 17. Now you can see my numbers. I increased the acreage, kept it the same, reduced the yield a little, pushed it back up. I just can't, I can't get the numbers tight. So either we're going to have to have bigger utilization than this, or we're going to have to see some reduction in acres or yield. You can see on a graph, this is a big ending stocks number followed by bigger and bigger. Total supply goes right on up, total usage goes right on up, but we end up increasing. You can see we've already gotten the first part of that component. South America is uh, in the harvest process. Brazil's almost 70% harvested, and you can see they're 10 million tons bigger than last year. Big yields in the United States, I doubt we can do that this year, uh, but I can't get my world numbers tight enough and I can't get my U.S. stocks tight enough, so I'm not even putting them on the graph. Here's our uh, sales. You can see, again, when the thermometer is up over 75, you can see these are where we made sales at and uh, where we have since harvest time. This is the new crop 15 sales. Um, we don't like these prices at all, but we don't think we have much choice other than to sell when our thermometer says to sell. Okay, people question sometimes the ability for the producers to cut yield, but you'll notice here, principal crops in the United States, we, we, this goes back to, to 2000. You can see we, from 2002, we went from about 327 million hectares, or acres, sorry, down to 315. We lost, we lost over 10 uh, million acres, and we quickly put 10 million acres on, quickly took 6 million acres off, a total of 11 million acres off, put it back on again. So we can move acreage of the total principal crops. And our belief is this year, uh, this number will come down. Uh, we've already seen those kind of forecasts. Farmers tend not to believe them, but you can see here 
that the yield or that acres do uh, move quite a bit. Okay, I think I run to the end of my presentation. What uh, questions does anyone have? Question here is, uh, why won't we see a shift of acres from soybeans to corn, according to your graphs? I think we probably will. I mean, I, we, we won't see it this year uh, because people aren't looking at that. Uh, nobody's out there talking, uh, encouraging farmers to plant corn um, at today's prices. Nobody's talking about anything other than poor market prices for the foreseeable future. So the direction will be a reduction in acreage, probably both corn and soybeans. And that's really what the USDA has forecast. But switching from beans to corn um, in an area that has uh, uh, what some of the more fringe areas, they don't have big enough corn yields to justify those out-of-pocket costs. We're all looking backwards and looking at 370. And so the acres aren't shifting until we see that it's actually looking ahead in the stock usage. Until people shift their forecast, forecast, and I don't think that'll happen until after planting season. Ethanol mandate uh, forecast on that, or what's your thoughts? Will that change gallons or bushels? Um, I don't know whether they'll whether they'll be able to make any changes. I, I mean, Congress is so uh, uh, jammed up. Uh, and the EPA is reluctant to do anything one way or the other. So uh, it would seem to me that the mandate we have will, will be the mandate we have for a while. Uh, if it's changed, uh, uh, then obviously we'll have to react to whatever that change is. Well, thank you very much, uh, John. And I, I guess just from those ending stocks, uh, looks like it's positive ahead for uh, folks that put up bins and hold it till next year at this time. And I know what really sunk in at some of those meetings is you said if they want to see a five in front of a, a bushel of corn, uh, they need to put a bin up and uh, wait till now from a year from now. I think that's exactly right. Uh, Steve, I think that, that the greatest service that your people can do uh, will be nudging farmers into going ahead and doing what they need to do. Um, farmers uh, uh, who don't have adequate enough uh, um, facilities to handle their harvest, uh, they get behind the eight ball every year. And they come to a marketing person and say, well, what can I do to get out from this eight ball? And the reality of it is you need to build some bins uh, because what you're ending up doing is you're getting stuck selling at the worst time of the year. And, uh, and that will be expensive for your entire career. All right. The opportunities are out ahead of us. So. All right, John, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate it.